Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm delighted to see so many people here, uh, particularly considering the scrum that was here yesterday evening um, for the very illustrious panel um, and the very engaging debate. I know that Europe isn't always as thrilling or as interesting, um, but, uh, but I do think that we're going to have a very interesting discussion here this morning. It's a particular um, honour for me to be here with you. Um, I've always been so impressed by the work um, of Joe and the committee and the organisers of the Glenties Summer School, of the McGill Summer School in Glenties. Um, and I suppose um, it's, it's just to say it's a huge honour for me to be here um, and to have been asked to speak uh, this year, particularly um, in the run-up to the, the referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. However, I have been asked to speak uh, in the context of Ireland and Ireland's relationship with Europe. Uh, so I don't propose to talk too much about the Lisbon Treaty. Um, it's, it's a nice opportunity to talk about Ireland and Europe more generally, and I think that that uh, will be the focus of, of, of my paper. Um, so the question that is posed is, does Ireland need Europe? Um, and I suppose it's fair to say that the question is in many ways perfunctory, because Ireland not only needs Europe, but it is in many ways dependent on Europe, and in particular on the European Union and our membership of the European Union. When Ireland joined the European communities, as they were then, in 1973, the Irish people recognised uh, the, the enormous opportunity uh, that, that lay before them. We saw, I suppose, that as a relatively new uh, and fledgling independent state, we were still very much cowering in the shadow of our nearest neighbour, and we saw that our best opportunity to assert our independence and indeed our sovereignty was through engagement with other sovereign nations, in a way almost bypassing or leapfrogging the one nation from whom we wished to assert our freedom at that time. And what freedom we gained, the freedom to move away from almost total reliance on the United Kingdom for our economic well-being, the freedom to develop our own unique and distinctive sovereignty by breaking the ancient reliance on one nation, by forging new relations with many other nations, new relations on our terms and as equal partners. And what a sense of self-confidence and self-belief Ireland has gained during those 36 years since 1973. Over the years, the European Union and in particular the common market, has provided a very important frame, framework through which Irish business um, and the Irish economy has thrived. Ireland has gained confidence and independence by accessing extensive com uh, consumer markets, and the EU has opened up huge opportunities for Ireland's economy to thrive. New, mar new markets opened up for us, which has seen the Irish economy ben benefit beyond all expectation. And Ireland has also very significantly been a major beneficiary of European funds since our accession to the EC in 1973. Uh, and oftentimes we don't like to be reminded of it, but it is a fact. Receipts from the EU budget during that period amounted to a staggering 60 billion euros, or 3.3% of our GDP, certainly not insignificant. And we have received billions of euros in structural funds, which have built roads and railways and other forms of infrastructure right throughout our country, stimulating further growth and improving Ireland's currency as an international economic hub. It's estimated that over a million jobs have been created in Ireland since 1973. And while there have been frustrations dealing with the bureaucracy and red tape and the, the various requirements of the EU system, overall it has most certainly benefited our country immensely. Our membership of the EU has been a re resounding success story. And there's no doubt that without the European Union, Ireland's Celtic Tiger, quite simply, would not have happened. And significantly, without the benefits of our membership of the EU, we will have little chance of emerging from our current economic distress. Of course, the European project has not been perfect. And I would be the very first to concede that there have been problems, glitches, disappointments along the way. But I do believe that we have to be realistic. 
This is an unprecedented project. Never before have so many independent nation states pooled their sovereignty and worked together in so many fields, political, economic, social, or indeed at so many levels, supranational, intergovernmental, national, regional, local. It's not comparable in any sense with the full-blown Federation of the United States of America, nor indeed is it, is it comparable with the, the, the type of loose cooperation that you see in, in uh, regional organizations such as the African Union. The European model is 100% unique, and in many ways it's, it's evolving all of the time. In a way, it is an uncharted process, unlike anything that has gone before, and it, require, it requires of us, the people of Ireland and the people of Europe, a sort of generosity of spirit, in addition to a political understanding, to recognise that sharing sovereignty is an act of benevolence, but also an act of very strategic self-interest. In the year 2009, we find ourselves at a watershed in the evolution of the, Euro of the European Union. The EU must achieve a number of things. It must respond to the world economic crisis in a decisive and a pragmatic fashion. It must find new ways of winning the hearts and minds of the European people, a challenge which, being honest, uh, has met with little success to date. It must also adapt to a changed global reality where regional cooperation is the order of the day and where the largest economy in the world must respond to the challenges posed by developing economies in other parts of the globe. So Ireland cannot afford to be a passive bystander in any of this. The world is changing and we must change with it. To quote George Bernard Shaw, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. I sincerely hope that Ireland will see that its interest is in playing the role of the reasonable rather than the unreasonable man. Ireland's interest will undoubtedly be served by continued engagement with the EU. But I'm calling for a different form of engagement to that which we have carved out over the past 36 years. Ireland has changed dramatically um, in, the, in this period. We joined the EC as something of a poor relation. Our average income was approximately 60% of the EU average. We have been so-called net beneficiaries since we joined. That's a euphemism. In other words, we have been taking constant handouts from our EU partners for 36 years. And the time has now come for a seismic shift in Ireland's attitude and approach to the European Union. We need to understand that it is not simply about what we can take. It's time for national reflection on just how we can engage with the European Union from now on. It's clear to me that Europe is a project of the future. The question for Ireland is whether we wish to invest in our future. Ireland is on its knees economically, and it is through no fault of the European Union. In fact, since the real depth of our recession was understood last summer, the, the European handout machine has been in overdrive, with the ECB lending more per capita to the Irish than any other member state, including all of the new Central and, and, European, uh, Central and Eastern European uh, members. <laughs> A total of 39 billion, to be precise, has been loaned to Irish re retail banks via the ECB. Without the ECB, it's inconceivable that some of our key banking institutions would be standing today. Bailouts and handouts have been the key to Ireland's interest and engagement in the European project since we joined. And we need to see Europe as a springboard now uh, for Ireland as a global player, as a tool to project Ireland into that all-important global economy. The Irish need to become key players in shaping the future of the European economy. We need to start looking at the potential that exists and play our part centrally in shaping the Europe of the future for the benefit of the Ireland of the future. Take, for example, the single market. Its potential is huge and largely untapped. 
Some people erroneously believe that the single market is something that happened back in Maastricht in 1992. That was merely the birth of the venture, which is largely incomplete. In fact, the best is, is, is yet to come, in my view. Over the coming years, there will be huge advan advances in the single market in terms of growth, in terms of jobs, in terms of competitiveness, in terms of employment. We in Ireland can either choose to play a role in shaping these advan advances or we can sit on the fringes, sullen-faced, waiting for more and more handouts from our frustrated partners. I know which option I prefer. I want Ireland to be a constructive player rather than a caustic spectator. If the treaty, which I promise not to mention, is passed in the coming months, a really exciting opportunity presents itself for the European Union. Some really crucial policy areas, energy security, climate change, to name just two, which have been nominally within the ambit of the European Union, will now, for the first time, have a firm legal base. This is essential for the development of these policies for the benefit of all citizens in Europe and beyond on a global scale. I believe that Ireland should embrace the challenge in these policy areas. We have an opportunity to develop thinking and become European and world leaders in these areas. Who better than a country internationally reputed as representing 40 shades of green to become the leading force in an all-important green, green economy. By embracing such change, Ireland has an enormous opportunity to lead these new economic sectors in Europe and in the world. By working more closely with our European partners, by developing the single market in the green sector alone, by, by cooperating in new uh, investment in R&D and new advances in, in green technologies, we could pioneer a whole new industry creating badly needed jobs and opportunities for our young people. On our own, we are simply an island, subject to the vagaries of the various economic storms that may hit. But as part of a regional bloc, such as the European Union, our opportunities are immense. It's through active cooperation and partnership, rather than reluctant participation, that our greatest successes will be derived. One of the criticisms of the EU is that it has been slow to react to challenges which present on the world stage. This criticism has been particularly vocalised in relation to the economic crisis late last year. There is something of an irony in this. On the one hand, every member state is hankering for the days of yore when they could behave as whimsically and irresponsibly as they liked without a thought for the implications on other on other sovereign states. On the other hand, they want the rules and institutional structures in place to respond rapidly to the many challenges that they may face. There's something of a, of a European paradox in that. It's time that we realise we cannot continue with the sort of institutional paralysis that exists in Europe. Member states will urgently need to engage in greater levels of decision-making at EU level, especially in the economic sphere, in order to prevent parochial national interests and, indeed, sectoral interests um, from grinding the EU to a halt. In my view, Ireland should be at the vanguard of this. I think that now is the time for Ireland, emboldened by our recent economic experience, to start trying to shape the European policies and structures that will equip us uh, for a new and inevitable phase of globalisation. First should be a radical reform of the so-called Lisbon Strategy. Most people have forgotten what the Lisbon Strategy is. It's not the Lisbon Treaty, it's something very different. It's the programme for jobs and innovation in the EU, which was established 10 years ago and reviewed in 2007. Despite the noble aspirations of this plan and the massive funds and efforts exerted in trying to implement it, most European citizens have never even heard of it. If you ask 99% of Irish citizens whether they are aware of the Lisbon strategy, they are likely to stare at you quite blankly. They may well think that it's a not very popular treaty, which they will have to vote on in October. 
On the other hand, and in contrast, most Irish people have probably heard of the Obama proposals for economic stimulation pushed through Congress last spring. There is a fundamental problem with communication in the European Union. One simple measure uh, would be to cease naming strategies and plans and treaties on the basis of the city in which they were signed. While this may flatter the ego of the President or the Prime Minister of the day, it does absolutely nothing to relate the objective of such a strategy or, or a plan uh, to the ordinary people of Europe. So the first task should be to rebrand the Lisbon strategy as the European Jobs Plan or the European Economic Repo Recovery Plan, something straightforward, something understandable and comprehensible. Secondly, the focus of such a plan needs to be twofold. There should be an internal focus, as already exists, on structural reforms within the EU, aimed at adapting the EU to globalisation, but with an added emphasis, uh, reflecting the, the times that we are in, on the knowledge economy, economy, sustainable growth, and in particular, strengthened economic governance, to prevent the type of regulatory failures that we have seen in recent years. Secondly, there needs to be a brand new external focus to such an economic plan, looking at the policies um, of trade and competition, environmental diplomacy, energy security, immigration, and it should be designed to, to shape uh, globalisation, not, not merely react to it, but for the EU to shape uh, the future of globalisation. Such a two-pronged approach would be beneficial for two reasons. Firstly, it would allow the European Union to develop its capacity to reform structures internally in order to meet the current demands and the current cha challenges of globalisation. And secondly, it would provide a new emphasis on shaping the global economy as it evolves. Ireland has the potential to play a really vital role in promoting such an ambitious economic strategy at EU level. I believe we would enhance both our own standing in Europe and, importantly, our own national self-interest by adopting such a constructive, persuasive role at EU level. Ireland should also look at promoting some bold and pragmatic Europe-wide solutions to the Europe-wide recession. Our inability to coordinate fiscal policy at European level is both good and bad. One might say we get the best of both worlds. Obviously, in Ireland, we are intent ourselves on retaining our autonomy in relation to taxation, and that was very much to the fore in the last referendum uh, on the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, this is positive because it ensures competition uh, in taxation terms between member states and can act as an incentive for foreign direct investment um, and uh, allows them and enables them to choose a small country such as ours. However, it can lead to delayed coordination and a failure for the EU to act in a concerted fashion at times of crisis. The institutional structures are just simply not there. However, why not advocate greater coordination on measures that do not impinge on the national interest of member states? Why not identify some big bang measures which could benefit all member states and would have the added advantage of resonating with all of the citizens of the European Union? One such measure could be, for example, the introduction of a voluntary coordinated uh, cut in VAT rates of, say, 1% across all 27 EU member states. This would be a coordinated budgetary stimulus, which would have the temporary effect, at least, of increasing demand for goods and services right across the EU, benefiting all of us. By virtue of its temporary nature, it would bring spending forward, given that there would be an expectation of a subsequent return to the original VAT rates. This would have positive stimulus effects right across the entire European Union. And, very importantly, it would be a popular, tangible measure that the citizens of Europe might well re relate to, and importantly, they might approve of. Finally, just to say, we're all aware Ireland is on its knees right now. By the end of this year, almost half a million people will be unemployed in this country. Ireland not only needs Europe, 
but Europe is our lifeline. We cannot afford to continue to entertain the type of begrudging attitude that has crept into our engagement with Europe over the years. We need to realise that our future is in shaping and moulding the Europe of the future. It is apt that this is the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. The collapse of the Berlin Wall liberated millions of people who had for so long yearned for the freedom and autonomy enjoyed by the people of the West. Now is the time, now is not the time, to reconstruct an Iron Curtain around this island of ours. We, we really and desperately need the support, the friendship and the cooperation of our European neighbours now more than ever. This is the only way in which we will truly be free and prosperous. Thank you very much.